Hello, 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 and welcome to a brand new episode of Pot Still Live, The Takeover. This is an absolutely fantastic and super special edition, uh, carrying on from last year's episode where we jumped into the dream cask of 2020. I am joined by Blender Dave McCabe for the release and tasting of Redbreast Dreamcast 2021. So, Mr. Dave McCabe from Irish Distillers and the Redbreast Blending team, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, as I say, uh, you know, it, I understand that you have a very busy job and jumping on a, a live stream at 8 p.m. on a Thursday evening is not a part of that job. So I really appreciate you giving us your time. And uh, where are you joining us from this evening? You, you look almost subtropic at the moment. Yeah, it feels that way. It's great. But uh, I'm actually in work. I'm in the distillery. Um, I, I live across the road. So, you know, when it comes to chatting to yourself, I, I knew the Wi-Fi would be a lot better over here. Um, and it's been raining all day, but suddenly the sun has come out now. So it feels like uh, feels uh, like I'm abroad. Sure. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and and paint the picture for the people who are either watching at home or watching back. Uh, are you in obviously a very, a very glass filled room? Are you in one of the offices or one of the labs or where might you be finding yourself? Uh, I'm up in our, we call it the Jemison room. It's our kind of main boardroom. So it's mostly glass and up on the second floor. But beneath me, I can kind of see the entrance of the distillery in the car park. And then behind me, um, you might hear it yourself every so often, there'll be trucks coming through, carrying in barley and malt or coming out with feeds, um, you know, or, or spent grains. So uh, there's a lot of activity and it's, you know, that, that'll go on till late in the evening as well. Certainly a distillery that doesn't sleep. <laughs> no, absolutely not, no. Well, I, as I said, I'm delighted to have you here. Um, throughout the show, we're going to do uh, a, a look, or I suppose a, a, a broad and, and then a deep dive look into the Redbreast Dreamcast release uh, for this year. Um, the fourth release in the Dreamcast series, is it? Fourth um, release, that's right, yeah. yeah. It's flown. Um, I was catching myself for saying three releases uh, just during the week and I had to count uh, as to what, what, what has gone before it. Um, we'll be jumping into a bit of a tasting and then uh, for the people who are watching at home, um, that you can, of course, uh, ask any of your questions throughout the show. And if we have the ability to answer them, um, I believe, Dave, you'll be more than happy to, to chat to people through uh whatever their their thoughts are or queries are on on the red breast range yeah absolutely no trouble at all well i i suppose a great place to start uh is what what in the world is is red breast dreamcast 2021 you know it's a a ballot system there were 924 odd bottles Eleven thousand people signed up for the ballot um, for anyone wondering, I'm I'm 0 for 4 on four different uh, Dreamcast releases, um, so I'm more than delighted to at least be able to to try a little bit. But what what is uh, Dreamcast 2021? Uh, so Dreamcast 2021 is kind of a follow-on expression from say last year's release because they were both actually made uh, at around the same time over over a year ago. Uh, and it stems back to actually going back even further to, to 2019 when myself and Billy, uh, Billy Lighton, were working on the Redbreast 27 kind of expression and um, with doing a lot of prototypes and working with various different samples. And, you know, as you do from a blending point of view, you, you look at what you have and see what would work and does it fit with the right brand. So we were working on that type of um, project. So when we did last year's Dream Cask, what you saw there was a marriage of four four whiskies, which we then say marry together and put back into a port barrel. Whereas this year's launch is those same four whiskies which we married, but some of that whiskey went back into the sherry barrel. So it lasted or was say finished in the sherry cask for 15 months before we bottled it uh, back in in February this year. So. It's a very interesting one if, if anyone's lucky enough to, to have got a bottle this year and even luckier to have got a bottle or a sample from last year's to compare them. Uh, you'll see a kind of a, a continuation of DNA, but obviously elements of differences come through as well uh, and 29 years uh, in the making as well. So um, a fantastic drop, which we'll share this evening, no doubt. Uh, absolutely, and that, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that you, you 
dove us into the cast straight away because it was definitely one of the questions I wanted to ask. Because as I was going through this year's press release, I was looking at the cast regimen, you know, an 89 bourbon into port in, in 95, a 91 second fill, a bourbon, 91 second fill bourbon, and then a 91 second fill bourbon put into sherry in 2011. And I was thinking, that sounds very familiar. Uh, and then I went through our, our our conversation from last year and you explained how that, you know, that ruby port was the the, the scene of the revatting of, of all four and I was very interested to hear that. Uh, so it was at the same time that you would have vatted in the same forecasts into uh, this Oloroso Sherry bus. Exactly right. You know, the, there was enough liquid from those four casks that allowed us to recask the two, the two wine barrels, essentially, that were used in the making. So as you said, the two bourbon barrels, um, a port, a ruby port cask, and an Oloroso Sherry. So when we emptied the four out, there was enough liquid to say, okay, let's refill back that port pipe also refill the sherry one. So then three months later, the last year's Dreamcast release was that port pipes, uh, say, contents, whereas we left the sherry continue on for another, say, 12 months beyond that, so 15 in total, and that's what we're launching this year. Um, the decision, I suppose, for recasking back into the two wine casks as opposed to something different is given the as you even highlighted there the the recasking nature of everything that was done um we didn't want to rock the boat too much with flavor from what was already created so we said by reusing that same sherry barrel it's effectively now it's second use so it's a second fill sherry so we felt if we had taken in a fresh you know first fill sherry and put the liquid into that it mightn't have done the whiskey too much justice because it was aged, it was very complex, and it was going to then get a big hit of oak and a big hit of fresh sherry. So we kind of made the conscious effort to say, let's not do that. Let's put it back into the original sherry where it came from and just let it rest nicely. Let all the liquids from the different casks mellow. Let them kind of gain a bit of a complexity by marrying with each other for that year, and you know, almost a half. Um, so... That was the kind of the thought process behind it. And um, I think, thankfully, it seemed to, to pay off. And for, for this release and, and the previous, I think, two releases, uh, if not all four releases, they've been a marriage of, of four casks, um, at least the majority. I think the 20-year-old, I can't remember the 32 going back that far, but I think the 20, the 28, and the 29 um, were all a marriage of four different casks. Um, why do you know in in my head you you are obviously going through myriads of of casts on a monthly basis why pull from four different types compared to maybe a single cask sherry or you know what what's the the thought process when you guys are going through the warehouses for this dream cask release a very good question and you know it, it's not something we had kind of planned to do uh, in the first place of having a kind of a, a mindset as to how the Red Rest Dreamcast needs to be. So the first Dreamcast 32 was a single cask. Um, so it was pots of whiskey that started off in, in bourbon and recast into sherry um, and was 32 years of age. But you're right, when it came to the second release, it was a marriage of, of casks again, including a, a PX sherry cask. Um, whereas these two, we hadn't planned to kind of replicate that at all. It was kind of just naturally born from looking at the casks that we had when we were making Redbreast 27. Uh, and we said, well, look, we've looked at some great samples. We know what we're going to do for the Redbreast 27. We have other sets of casks that we looked at in those parcels. Why don't we marry them on a smaller scale, but beef up the port element in it? Um, to see what we'd get from it. And then it was like, well, look, there's enough there to put into the sherry. Let's see how that is coming along. So we didn't kind of peg them for the next iterations of Dreamcast straight away. We just, that's kind of part of what myself and Billy would do on a regular basis when we're looking at various samples. And we say, look, there's something in those. Let's marry them, put them aside, look at them every couple of weeks or every couple of months. And if there's something worth telling the guys in marketing about that we've done, um, happy days, and if not, then we'll be scrambling to try and 
find the next uh, dream cask otherwise. So it was um, a happy, a happy discovery, first of all, those casks. And then it was a bit of an experimentation based on working on new brands. Um, but saying that, as you said, you know, we do go through a lot of different casks throughout the year. So every so often we find um, a kind of a special one. But if it's extremely old, there mightn't be that much left in it. So that's the other element we suppose have to take into to consideration as well. Uh, Dave, Dave Cummins dropped into the chat and he's wondering, are, at, this, at this point of the day, are you enjoying the whole Dreamcast experience on releases or do you just switch off the phone uh, when, when, when they go out? Well, even in work, there's a, a lot of people who um, would say that they've entered the dialet um, more than once. <laughs> Most people would say um, that are honest enough to say it. Um, but it's great. There's a lot of hype about it, um, which is fantastic. Um, but you do kind of keep your head down around the time when people say, geez, I didn't get one at all and things like that. And um, you know, I, I do try and if I have a little drop to give anyone, uh, I'll try my best to do it, but I, I can't give it to everyone, unfortunately. Um, so it's uh, it's a time you want to kind of dodge the crowd and work as much as anywhere else. Oh, that's very fair. Um, <clears throat> so the Mick McGuire dropping in saying, do you spot uh, do you spot taste casks during the course of the year uh, and think they could be contenders for the Dreamcast now? Or are you, you know, specifically targeting certain casks or I suppose flavor profiles for, for something like Dreamcast? It's a, a very good question. Um, so we would we would try and look at what we have throughout the year for various projects, plus the idea of, of what would be out there in our warehouses that would be definitely worthy of, of a Dreamcast offering. Um, but saying that, we do have to bear in mind that it is a red breast style of whiskey that it'll have to fall within in terms of its DNA. Um, but that's not to say we mightn't ever use something that hasn't been used before in terms of casks for red breast. But so far, we're sticking within the realms of kind of the current, you know, uh, I suppose, style of red breast. So it's bourbon, sherry, port. The PX was a bit of an outlier because we haven't really worked with PX before um, and not with, with red breast. So it's kind of a bit of both. We look at what we have when we can um, because we're constantly just making other brands kind of day in, day out. But we look at what we have, see if it's, you know, put into the special category or the kind of, you know, new edition category, etc. cetera. Um, and then something that just... What else could we do? So if it's a recasking operation, you know, do we need to do that? So there's a lot of a lot of thought process, but it's definitely just from sampling throughout the year as opposed to a, a specific deadline, so to speak. Yeah, and, and even on your on your point there about making sure it's red breast, I suppose, for, for Dreamcast. And that's a, a very interesting uh you know point as well because Obviously, we spoke before about the kind of range of, of distillates and the range of finishes and cast maturations that Middleton has. They fit into brand families. And, and you know, sometimes you might have, and last year you touched on this, that you you had, you might not have a, a use for Malaga casks in 1991, but you lay down a tranche of them every couple of years in hope that maybe there'll be a brand iteration or, or a brand home or landing home for that going down the line. but even I think in some degrees, the port was a, a, a step for Redbreast, perhaps with the dream cask in itself. Then that's a, a personal opinion, but obviously Redbreast being so famous for its bourbon and sherry, uh, you know, vattings. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see how it, it takes life in other directions than how maybe we would always, you know, know the, the regular skews or sorry, um, expressions um, of, of Redbreast in the dream casks. Yeah, you know, you, you have to be very mindful of of the brand and how it's represented around the world. So as you said, it's bourbon and sherry. And, you know, we would definitely be heavier on the communication with people about the sherry influence of Redbreast. Because, you know, for us, that's what we find is a very dominant feature and flavor of that brand, more so than uh, Middleton or Powers or Jemison. So that's how we, I suppose communicated to everyone it's you know it's hot single pot Irish whiskey 
It's a, a marriage or a vatting of whiskies aged in bourbon and sherry. Um, but when we talk about red breast, it's the sherry element we definitely emphasize more. So it, it really was, I suppose, dipping the toe into uncharted waters by using a port cask for red breast. But it felt right in the sense that, you know, we are talking a lot about Spanish wine casks, kind of casks from the Iberian Peninsula. Portugal isn't that far away. It's also a fortified wine. Uh, in terms of flavor, we would say sherry is more dried fruits, whereas board casks contribute more fleshy fruits, kind of plums and stone fruits. So it seemed to just be a natural succession of cast types to, to move into a port area for red breast without worrying, is it going to be harmful for what customers or lovers of red breast would, would deem acceptable, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And, and I think it's quite interesting you're saying, you know, when you're looking at that batting in terms of the dream cask, you know, you're talking about putting it back into the sherry or the or the port and it, it already being used and wouldn't overpower and, and yet also still now fit into the, the brand profile. Um, I imagine a, a, an all rum dream cask would be very atypical or in left, <laughs> left field of the of the red breast family. Um, while I, I imagine a rum finish on top of all these other flavors would probably come out delicious, but it would definitely be a, a an interesting look. Um, Alan McAvoy dropping in saying he's a, well, first of all, evening. Uh, so good evening to you, Alan. Um, and he's delighted to finally win the ballot and get a bottle of dream cask. He's been pinching himself all week. Well, I'm delighted for you. Um, as I said, I'm still not for four. Um, I hope, I hope you have a nice stash, uh, in the house or in the office, Dave and um, at least well, in the in trophy cabinet you know I'll, I'll keep them locked away for now anyway that's all i can say <laughs> but you know i'm definitely one of the very lucky few to, to be able to have samples when i need them on demand from our lab so uh i don't want to rub it in with anyone but uh yeah it's, it's great <laughs> I was going to say, I don't envy you either because working in distilleries, you know, robbing samples from labs is, is very difficult in itself. Yeah. <laughs> Retained samples are very important. And uh, so I, I, I say kudos to you. Um, but uh, <laughs> Matt Kelly over in uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina wants to know, he's a two-part question. Uh, does Jerry Garland uh, of the IDL uh, single pot still team get special compensation each year for being the sacrificial lamb to deal with the thousands of angry consumers who didn't get their uh, dream casks. And if not, why does he not get special compensation? <laughs> well, Jer is the nicest man you will ever meet in the world of the whiskey industry, uh, hands down. Um, so I think it's great to, to send him out as a sacrificial lamb because no one's going to give out to him too much because they know how nice a guy he is. So uh, he's too good. He's too nice for his own, um, you know, benefit really, or his own good. But um, yeah, unfortunately, there's so many people, as you said, 11,000 entrants for it and only 924 bottles to go around. Um, but I am hearing and from Jer telling me and, and Billy and stuff that there's a lot of bottle shares and things like that, which is which is great to see. So, you know, the, a bottle will get around to just more than one person for a lot of them. And, and that's a good point. I've actually probably seen this year multitudes of more bottle shares than any of the previous years um i see surges from irish whiskey magazine asking a good question he's saying what what kind of cask lends itself to to marriage or batting um you know when you're at that point of the 27 28 29 32 years of age there's obviously got to be a fear you know obviously you're seasoned professionals but there's got to be a fear at that point that if you put it into like you said a fresh sherry cast that's come over from Antonio Paez that you can just over oak it or, or completely throw the flavors askew. And then you've definitely not built a dream cask out of that. Uh, so what, what, what do you in, internally look for, for cast for, for batting marriages or finishes? Yeah. And you know, Billy, Billy's in the industry 44 years. Um, and I'm in it 11 and there's still, even now for even Billy, there's still always the fear of, it going wrong when it comes to a vatting if you're not really confident with the cask you're going to put the vatting into um so you know what we would look at uh, you know as we said there about you know steering away from fresh barrels too much if you're dealing with old very old whiskey 
Um, the only time you might want to do that would be, say, if you have very old whiskey that's in a second or a third fill bourbon barrel. And what I mean by second or third fill, it's a barrel that we're now using uh, for the second time or the third time. And bear in mind, it did hold bourbon before we got it. So a third fill bourbon barrel might yield very little oak contribution, but it lets the whiskey age very well to allow a vibrancy of the spirit still shine through even after decades in the barrel. So you what you, you would think about there is, okay, well, do we want to drive up the oak a bit for that one at the end, or do we want to bring in another element? And you might recask into a newer type of cask in that scenario. But when you look at the dream cask, for example, for this year, we knew there was such an array of flavor already there from the four different barrels that it wouldn't do those flavors any justice by putting into a fresh wine barrel or a fresh bourbon barrel or absolutely not uh, an unseasoned barrel, like a virgin American oak or virgin European oak. So you would know to stay away from those types of casks um, for sure. Um, other casks which we learned about um, from other brands like Method and Madness with Chestnut, we didn't realize how um, porous chestnut is compared to oak um, and how, say, uh, as with giving in oak tannins and flavor it is compared to the likes of American oak. So, you know, knowing those bits of knowledge is definitely enables you to not make the, the decision to use those casks for something as special as a dream cask, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, and obviously very important choices. And I, I have vivid memories of, uh, of, of Jerry Buckley telling me stories about an American, a very large and multinational American distillery, uh, looking for his advice, um, when creating a release to be finished in, I believe it was, was it, uh, Walnut maybe. Um, and they thought, you know, nice, dense hardwood, there's going to be a worldwide release. And Jerry was saying, you know, you'd be careful of the, the, the grain. He wasn't so sure on how tight the grain would be. And he started to hear reports back, I think. And I, and I don't want to mistell this story, but I just remember him saying that every time he checked in with them, there was, there was less and less in the cast because the, the, while a hardwood, the, the grain was, was so poor, so wide and so porous, there was, it was leaking and leaking. <laughs> and then eventually it was like a worldwide release. It was a US release. It was a Kentucky release. Then it was going to be a distillery release. And then he heard back, they were like, yeah, we're not releasing that. Um, yeah. And it just, it just got to the point where it was so, I don't know, either over oaked or so empty in the barrel that, you know, that, that, that barrel choice obviously didn't work out. And that was my, my first warning, I think back in 2013, 2012, Jer's uh, first first advice on not putting whiskey into every barrel that sounds exciting. That's the thing. It's, um, you know, when it comes to experimentation and, and we do a lot of it with different types of wood, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is if, if it could be done successfully, it already would be done. Um, so when I mentioned chestnut, like that historically would have been used for, for wine seasoning, chestnut barrels. Uh, and even, as you mentioned, Antonio Poyet, who we buy our sherry casks from, Antonio, who's in his, say, his 50s or, well, early 60s now, he started off as a cooper working on chestnut wood, making barrels for the wine industry. Um, so at least those, you know, even though it's new for us and experimental for us, we knew it had been used somewhere else, which is which is great. But I can see how using something brand new mightn't necessarily work every time for sure. No, absolutely. And I, and I presume as well, when you're experimenting and as experimenters myself, but the, the likes of those new casts you'll get in likely, uh, freshly charred it, the likes of, you know, wall or not to wall chestnut or, or mulberry, you're likely not getting them from other industries. They're coming freshly coopered or virgin oak in some cases. And maybe the first, the first round of whatever went into it might be very aggressive in a lot of flavors, but the second round might be great. Um, and I'm sure that takes a, that takes patience and a lot of, um, trial and error, I suppose. It does. And I suppose the one thing to be mindful of from, um, like a whiskey making point of view is you know, yourself, it's, it's all about time as well. And having, having to give yourself the time to let whiskey just sit there and age. 
um, and see how it's developing. But also bear in mind, is there a point where you need to move it on and stop the aging within that particular barrel and put it into something like, a, like an older bourbon barrel where you've now kind of halted any further development more than you would like to see. So um, when, you're, when you're dealing with new barrel types, there's a lot of elements to consider. Um, as you said, so it's um, it's it's fascinating to be perfectly frank. In a in a very old industry, there's still brand new avenues that we've yet to explore ourselves. Well, we've talked a lot about barrels. We've talked a bit about whiskey. Perhaps time to jump into what we're actually here to talk about. And I see there's a number of people in the comments saying they have their bottles in front of them as well. So I welcome I welcome them. So we are trying the, the 2021 edition of the Dreamcast, the Redbreast Dreamcast, uh, 29 years old. Um, it is the Oloroso Sherry Butt uh, expression, uh, which is the, the vatting or marriage of the four casks that we mentioned earlier on. 51.2%. Um, yeah, that's right. Good to have that correct. Um, so I've thrown a little, little bit into we'll put it here. Um, would you mind taking us through it from, from your point of view? Yeah, so again, just to highlight the uh, cask split, it was two bourbon barrels, a sherry barrel and a port barrel, port pipe which you married, recast into the sherry barrel for 15 months and bottled it at cask strength. So on the nose, we would typically describe certain aromas coming through there as uh, licorice, uh, you'll get a hint of cinnamon spice. Um, you know, when we talk about licorice, that can move to kind of a herbal element. So we would say like freshly crushed garden mint would be a kind of a nice descriptor when we look at herbs from a style of this with type of whiskey. When you think of the fruits, um, you would get your typical dried fruits again from the sherry, a touch of... Um, more a little bit tropical fruit, but what we're finding on this particular style is um, because maybe it's the, to do with a lot of oak as well and fruit, there's a, a kind of a bitter chocolate element with the fruit. So we're thinking bitter fruits, marmalade type of characteristic coming through as well. And then there's heavier notes in the back. So we would think of kind of worn leather, um, old kind of leather bound books tobacco leaf character as well billy lighten just dropping in saying he's on his 21st birthday so he's, he's delighted to be drinking whiskey older than him so well i forgot to say to billy the other day but um you know when we mentioned about the cask mix the the port cask was filled on the 16th of october which is billy's birthday and then the sherry cask which was filled in november and was recast 10th of march is actually my birthday so uh there's some dates there i must um we must celebrate billy for for this particular drop <laughs> it's very uh serendipitous very very much so so uh on the nose as well you know you would think a cast strength that the spices would be more intense than they are but uh for me the, the spices are definitely more of a, a mellowed effect rather than you'd get in in certain other whiskies at cast strength as well but uh, for me, what jumps out spice wise, more wood spice as opposed to kind of peppery. Again, it's cinnamon uh, and nutmeg as well. So if you want to have a taste, maybe yeah. and see what you think. Slaunch it. Slaunch it. need to kind of meditate on that for a while, I think, but um, very luscious. It's, it's, it's very luscious, but one of the things that kind of strikes me on this is I, I was revisiting my tasting notes of last year's cask, and I think amazing because I, I described it as bursting with tropical fruits last, you know, and, and while the same four distillates just with two different finishing casks, this is a very different uh, beast altogether. Still decadent and, and rich and full of flavor, but an entirely different at direction. You know, yeah. one's gone north and one's gone east. 
absolutely. You know, as you say, with the stone fruits and tropical fruit for the, the port edition, this is, you know, we described as more kind of brown sugar, kind of almost demerara sugar type of characteristic, um, kind of a, a luscious but viscous type of character, almost kind of chewable to a degree. Uh, the tannins you would expect to be bigger as well um, in terms of a cold tea or uh, an astringent effect, but I think the sweetness overrides that to a degree. So you get a mild tannin kind of mouthfeel to it, but the sweetness definitely, I think, takes away too much of that astringency as well, given the age of the whiskey. And it's, and it's a fantastic sweetness as well, because it's not just, a, there's not really that kind of, there's a bit of vanilla in there, but there's not that kind of, vanilla kind of candy shop sweetness it's it's much more of a, a like a more of a fruit sweetness with that again with that demerara sugar that kind of nice not treacle but that kind of lovely kind of viscous sugar to it as well which is yeah. a, a, a delicious um alternative to i think what a lot of people would think which you've got two bourbons in there in name and or three you know three or four bourbons in there in name but there's not that kind of recognizable American punch. There's so many lovely, juicy fruits in that. And again, like the nose, the spice isn't overly intense on aroma for me, and it certainly isn't over overly intense in the in the taste or the 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 finish. So it's it's kind of more warming spices than kind of what we describe sometimes as chili oil spice or kind of a, a fiery spice. It definitely has none of that going on. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of a cliche to say at this point, I think, in, in the world of whiskey, but it, it's one of those things that doesn't taste, it doesn't have the astringency or the the alcohol burn or the unbalanced nature you find with a lot of whiskeys in that kind of 52% ABV. And whether, whether that's, a kudos to you or i'm clearly drinking too much cash strength whiskey uh, to be decided but um fantastically palatable and, and and very vibrant in flavor for the the strength of abv very vibrant and again given the age of it as well sometimes you find certain whiskies can can become a bit lifeless to a degree with a lot of age because of maybe the oak overtakes the distillate um but here we find that you know, we feel anyway that the distillate kind of held up well against the oak and against the seasoning in those barrels of the port and the sherry at the same time. So you do get the kind of the pot still element still coming through. Uh, you still get a nice level of oak, but you also still get the seasoning of the previous, say, ruby port and the, the sherry particularly um, still offering themselves in flavor uh, in the final in the final taste. Spectacular, and, and if anyone is, you know, very few people are cracking their bottles right now. I think I see one or two people, in the comments that have, have a bottle share on the way or that kind of thing. But if anyone is brave enough to crack their bottle for for this, do let us know your thoughts in, in the comment section as well. Um, I, I suppose for the people at home who are sitting and 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 looking at yourself, Dave. Uh, obviously yourself and Billy in in the the blending house. Uh, I won't say. The blending team because i know in in our sitters there's there is a large blending panel if not team um but how did you come to be a part of that if that makes sense that was that i i received that about 10 15 times in the in gathering questions from people online uh working up to this obviously people looking outwards in think of the the very glamorous lifestyle of sitting on live streams and and drinking 29 year old whiskey at 8 eight thirty on a thursday evening but um what was uh and i suppose in some ways i know the answer to this but was was it a, a a life fulfilled by science that you had to you banged down the door with with billy day one and handed him your science degree and said i will be a organoleptic expert uh, or how did you how, become a part of of such a fabulous team um well i wish i'd studied science first of all first of all but um i i started to wear stairs back in 2010 and it started in the kind of the, the old middleton distillery side the old visitor center side as a, a part-time job essentially uh and a year later um 
I was asked to be involved in setting up a whiskey school, uh, which is the Irish Whiskey Academy, uh, which was a great, great opportunity to get more into production on a, on a very more kind of detailed level, because what that involved was, first of all, fitting out an actual school within one of the old buildings on site and um, where we would have people come in, uh, be it people in the industry, be it our own sales staff, etc., be it, you know, whiskey writers, journalists to learn about pots of whiskey and grain whiskey. Um, and it was kind of a practical course with blending and distilling. So part of the, I suppose, the, the formation of that, I was, you know, working up here in different departments just to get a feel for what's involved because we are writing a kind of a whiskey manual at the same time. So that was the very, I suppose, first step for me in getting my foot in the door, say, of the, the working distillery. So I worked at the Academy for a number of years. And as I said, part of that might be doing blending classes with groups. Uh, but I'd also travel to events as well, like Whiskey Live um, in different parts of the world and other events. And obviously, Billy would be there and we, we got on very well when we were at events. And Billy then would kindly help in the blending classes when he'd be on site um, in the academy. And from there, I suppose, we just struck it very well. Um, and we talk about whiskies and go through certain, you know, cast types and things like that. And um, a year or two later, then I got a, a call from Peter Moorhead, who was um, a director here uh, in Middleton. And he just said, look, you know, Billy's looking for an apprentice to to kind of take under his wing and, you know, bring into the world of blending if that's something that would, you know, you'd be interested in. So, of course, it um, didn't take long to, to give an answer back to that. So I kind of started off on a trial basis with Billy for a year as a kind of an apprentice, essentially. So I didn't get the title of blender at this point, and um, just in case, look, it didn't work out in, in any way. So for that year, I just spent the whole time with Billy, you know, looking at different samples, understanding the complexity of not only the physical nature of, of blending, but also managing stock. Because uh, we would have forecasts for our brands that go out to, you know, 2060. So how do you manage your stock today for the future? And how do you deal with the stock you have today that someone else put down in barrels, you know, three decades ago? So it's uh, it was a huge learning curve. And I remember I finished that year's kind of apprenticeship and was on holidays at Christmas and Billy rang just to say he'd like to keep me as a as a blender on the team. And it's been, um, you know, best best uh, thing ever. But uh, I unfortunately didn't have a science background, but I that, don't think that really held that against me because um, he comes from a, an accounting background himself, um, which definitely would benefit any blender when you're managing so many casks, um, you know, for, for so many years out to the future. And so we have a team um, in terms of a central lab. So we have a taste panel. So anytime we're working on samples or quality control, the taste panel will be there to, to look at things as well and just cast their nose over anything we do. But essentially the last few years, it's been myself and Billy on the blending team. But we've recently had a new member join us, uh, Deirdre Carroll, who's been working in the distillery for the last nine, nine years now as well. Um, and she's joined us this year. So we're looking forward to, to having a new member on, on the team now. Fantastic. <laughs> I tell you what, that was a hell of a part-time job. <laughs> uh, you couldn't, you couldn't envisage what was ahead of you after starting just at the old Middleton Distillery for for what you thought was just going to be a summer before you you move on. You know, so uh, amazing how things work out. I guess. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I, I'd love to jump in a little bit into that the the I don't want to say the accounting side, but the the forecasting side and the and the stock management side because often a part of the blending business people don't think about um and you're looking at barrels as you said people laid down a decade two decades three decades ago who were forecasting for you know in terms of three decades ago nowhere near the sales i imagine that you know of of different brands are going ahead now and then you're trying to figure out what the projections look like in the future. 
And from a, a blending point of view, you know, if I, I don't want to speak too much about the, the past right now, but in a blending point of view, you have an X amount of uh, casts you want to lay down of each type, I imagine, per year of each distillate style. How important is that, you know, month by month or annual or whatever, I, I presume it's annual maybe, that you look at that that's met bang on or, you know, if there's an unexpected shutdown, does that throw your um, forecasts or your, your stock laying down? At the, maybe if you're in the middle of a tranche or a, or a parcel of, of ports, say, and suddenly there's there's no ports or, you know, there's a plant shutdown. Does that does that mess with the forecasts or push them out or do you have to accelerate on the far end? Um, yeah, there's so many so many variables that when it comes to planning and forecasting, you know, a lot of it is is a guide to help you try and aim or achieve what you're aiming for. But you'll find, you know, you can only be as accurate as much as you use the information that's given to you from the different markets around the world, say for demand, first of all. Um, so that's one element, but you find that the, the goalposts in terms of volumes will change um, sometimes dramatically from year to year. And if you've, say, put down a lot of stock, say, in your, in your distillation plan for the future that you fill so many barrels today, knowing that the, in five years' time, the demand for Jemison is X volume, and suddenly there's a huge drop-off due to maybe COVID or there are some tariffs in a country that we hadn't foreseen. So we're not drawing stock from the warehouses for bottling as as what we had expected. So you then have a buildup of stock. Um, so you have to manage, well, how do we how do we manage that? So maybe you let the whiskey go a bit older for that brand, or you parcel it off and say, look, we'll leave that for another brand that we can maybe see envisage getting more popular in 10 years time and it might do for a, a 15 year old style so there's that element of variability with market demands essentially uh, and then unexpected shutdowns aren't too frequent thankfully but we do have a, a planned shutdown every july so we have very little stock laid down any year in the month of july and in any calendar year we have uh, of stock so sometimes you have to make sure we overproduce more if we can in the June month to cover the July. And then we're back into the stock in August if we're drawing down based on, a, on an age profile. So there's, I suppose my point is there's a, a lot of variability and you can't get it spot on ever. But you, can, you always need some sort of a guide to give you direction for now, but keep being flexible to, to change with that. Um, I don't think anyone saw the huge, I suppose, surge in popularity in Redbreast even five years ago to know, you know, should we be putting down more sherry casks than we had envisaged? Um, but you can't suddenly order more sherry casks tomorrow because they take four years to arrive from the time you order them. So you, you have to work with what you have as well, despite what might be going on in the world around you in terms of popularity for your brands as well. So. Um, yeah, there's there's just a huge amount in it, as you said, that no one might necessarily see outside of a, a distillery. And and if I can pick a, pick a specific example, and I don't want you to have the actual answer, but from a, a blender's point of view, um, in this uh, Dreamcast release, cask one, as it was listed in the regiment of casks, was laid is a bourbon laid down in '89, and in '95, was one of the team transferred it into a ruby port barrel uh and in 95 i'm imagining there wasn't a, a ruby port idea of where that would go there wasn't a brand that needed that at that time so from from a a, a blending point of view why why would you tran why would you transfer that as opposed to filling a fresh cask or you know picking an older cask or that kind of idea i just I love seeing some of the details and wondering why then, why that, if that makes sense. And I obviously don't think you have the exact answer, but from your blending point of view, what would you think? Yeah. Well, I suppose we, you know, we have a plan for casks when they come in of what we're going to, to fill them with. Um, 
And, you know, we would, myself and Billy, for the fortified wine casks particularly, we have, I suppose, two or three goals when these casks come in. So the casks arrive yeah, usually kind of from autumn till spring. And um, that's the kind of period of time they get shipped over. So we would have a filling directive that we would tell the, the guys in the in the spirit store. Um, so we, we break it down to say, OK, we plan to fill X amount of these wine casks with new make spirit. And we're going to leave age in its entirety. Uh, however, not all whiskies we want for our brands or for the future. We want fully matured because, again, that gives you a certain flavor profile. But if we take some of those sherry casks or pork casks coming in and we put a certain amount of them to the side to be filled with five or six year old whiskey from bourbon, what we're doing there is we're changing the, the flavor profile of that particular whiskey down the line as well, where it's not going to be heavily, heavily sherried without having some a bit of a bourbon undercurrent to it as well. So that's from a, a flavor profile point of view. And then say the final tranche of casks that we look at, we'd say, okay, well, we're going to use them for finishing whiskies in. So for the likes of Redbreast Lestow, that would be whiskey that's 10, 11 years of age, where we'd fill into sherry for six months to a year to even a year and a half before bottling it. So they're the kind of reasons you would do it from your I suppose from your flavor variability point of view, you want some fully matured sherry, some recast sherry casks down the line, um, uh, as well as some finished whiskey in sherry casks. But as well, when you look at your future demands, and as I said, maybe we didn't know how popular Redbreast is going to be, that in 18, 19 years time, looking at the stock we have now and what we're filling, we might see uh, a pinch that we're going to have problems with maybe availability of certain casks to make red breast in in that year. So if we move whiskey now into different barrels, by the time they're needed in 15, 16 years time for a brand, they'll have been in the right cask for the last 15 or 16 years. So that's another kind of an operation to plug any kind of troughs of stock you have for the future as well. So they're all the kind of, I suppose, the levels of, of thought that goes into it when you have casks coming in. It's a lot of parallel thoughts to have. <laughs> and so, God bless, I say, like, God bless whatever spreadsheet uh, you guys work off. <laughs> um, and, and I, I want to ask your thoughts on this. There was, there was um, a person from another large distillery uh, once told me, and it's a, it's a quote that's stuck in my head, for better or for worse, and they said that uh, nobody ever sets out to make a 30-year-old whiskey. Um, 30-year-old whiskeys happen by circumstance of warehousing or stock, troughs, peaks, so on and so forth. Um, but you have a 27-year-old whiskey now. Um, and I don't know if anyone in Irish distillers set out 27 or 29 years ago at this point to make a 27-year-old whiskey. Um, but I suppose, what do you what do you think of the, the statement that you know nobody sets out to make a third year old whiskey? I'm sure some people put aside one or two casks, but maybe not tranches or even follow through stock. You know, and last year you talked brilliantly and very heavily about the fact that if you make a 27 year old, or if you lay down experimental casks, you need stock to follow through so you can actually have you know something that's releasable at the far end of it. And repeatable that's that's the thing like last time talking to you um last march you know i would have mentioned how the likes of predecessors to to kevin o'gorman in maturation the likes of brendan monks didn't have a brand at all in his mind about what port casks would be used for but knew to start buying them every year and just laying them down um you know if we can afford to buy casks that aren't needed all the better because it'll give you something in the future and maybe not necessarily for the generation that bought the casks, but just to have on site for the distillery itself. Um, so yeah, no one, no one plans maybe to, to have a 30 year old whiskey, but you know, the more stock you build up and the more you just keep putting away. But as, as you said, you definitely have to kind of keep consistent then from year to year, 
or you, you'll you just have a nice one-off addition, maybe, without being able to back it up every year because you didn't keep buying those casks. So, um, you know, for us, when we buy unusual casks, we'll kind of put the effort in to maybe try and get them every year for a while, even if it's only a pallet of them, just to have some sort of a continuation should they become successful. And if they don't, you know, all good and well, like they won't go to waste. They might just be used in our lifetime. Hence, they'll be there for the next generation who didn't plan to have a 30 year old cask for when they're in the distillery. So um, it's great to have your your forecast and your sales filling the right casks for those brands, but also have a, a blank canvas of kind of thought of let's just do other cask fillings and battings and recaskings and put them away and just go back to them in a year's time and, and see how they're performing and maybe repeat that every so often. And in 10, 15 years time before you know it, you have a nice potential brand you can make or style of whiskey and you have all the stock from the previous years to back it up every year to, to keep making it as well. Fantastic. So I, I got a question sent to me there and I was asking whether or not uh, you guys have already kind of set aside some future Dreamcast potentials. I won't say Dreamcast releases, but um, now I asked you last year, did you have Dreamcast 2021 uh, laid out? And the answer was no. And now knowing that there was a potential on the sideline, you know, that was the same distillate in a different cask that came to fruition, perhaps I, I phrased my question incorrectly. Um, <laughs> and um are, are there more potentials in your mind and Billy's mind that are set aside? Are they casks that the warehouse managers are getting super annoyed that you keep asking for samples of, from the same casks or, or anything like that? Yeah, there, there's a, a few guys, all right, that I, I'm sure we've played with. They should have said, why don't you just ask for three bottles the first day instead of, you know, 10 bottles the last three months? But, uh, well, just as you mentioned it, I was only speaking to Billy earlier today and I was looking at some old samples that I'm going to post to him tomorrow to look at and we'll kind of add them to the list of potentials. But there's absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing confirmed for next year yet, which is kind of nearly a bit worrying given that it's June for us because bottling and packaging and labeling will be on to us sooner than later saying, have you picked it yet? But, you know, we don't want to make it kind of um i don't know what the term is really but contrived that you know we're just going to do it for the sake of it being a dream cask we want to find the right one or find the right parcel of casks to do a batting if needs be so we're kind of going through them slowly but i have some samples now to send billy tomorrow and um, that he'll get probably monday at this stage we'll chat about them during the week and they'll be on the the potentially in or the out list and we'll keep doing that for the next few weeks um, but we've nothing yet confirmed absolutely nothing as of yet anyway and i like that you do mention yeah. that that labeling packaging mm -hmm. uh, bottling uh, marketing sales everyone will be on to you at this point because i'm sure it's a uh, trying to to create a whole new uh, expression and package and everything uh takes takes a share of time and particularly, you know, the outer package changes every year and it has to reflect what you're doing. And I'm sure it's it's a, a, a mammoth task uh, to get that all in one place. Um, I am conscious of time. We are running down the clock. Um, and I have, uh, I suppose, an interesting question um, from, from Sergius from the Irish Whiskey Magazine to kind of round out the night. And he said, uh, have you learned anything from Billy that you hope to, you know, either apply or, or pass on to the next apprentices that come down the line in, in our sitters, or maybe even just to expand on that further, something that you've learned from Billy that you found that stuck with you or, or something really interesting that, or maybe unexpected that, that you've really enjoyed learning and perhaps will, you know, show others down the line. Uh -huh you know where where do you start is the is the main thing you know to answer that um i suppose what i learned from billy particularly is you know how thorough he is when it comes to managing the blending side of things be it from the sensory side or from the the managing the stock side because you you really have to have kind of an intimate knowledge of of your stock um and to do that 
it, there's a lot of time time of going through the nitty gritty details of of what you have in your in your warehouses, and that's something I'm still learning myself, trying to just double check, triple check, you know, everything we do when we're looking at what we have and can we can we produce whiskey of certain volumes? Can we keep it consistent? Can we manage expectations of volume? And they're all the things that when I signed up with Billy hadn't even crossed my mind. I thought it was just going to be every day in a lab, you know, mixing things in a graduated cylinder. And um, so I learned very quickly uh, it's not. So, you know, that's what I've learned. And I think it's good character building thing just to take a step back, not always have to rush everything like we do in life, be it, you know, even our, our dinners and things like that. It's just about taking a step back and being as thorough as you can. Um, and that's what, I suppose Billy would be famous for in terms of just producing, you know, and having produced the best quality whiskies that come out of Middleton year on year. Um, so it, it's a it's a nice way of thinking about things because it's all about time and, and being thorough. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dave, for your time uh, <laughs> and your thoroughness to follow on from that. Um, <laughs> But no, I, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, I, I know that it's taking time out of your evenings. Um, I'm sure you're absolutely hounded to talk about Dreamcast these days. Um, and obviously a, a massive highlight on the, the Irish whiskey calendar of releases. It's definitely the one uh, people look forward to. I think the most, it's definitely one of the most sought after. Whomever came up with the idea, I hope they got a raise. Um, <laughs> um but uh, it, as I said, this year was the Dreamcast 29-year-old uh, Oloroso Sherry Cast Edition. I'll see if I can hold that up to the camera a little bit there. Um, perhaps a, a, a sibling of, of last year's. I don't know if that's polite to say or correct to say, um, but a, a very, very different uh, expression altogether um, and fits very nicely into my little red breast family I have sitting back here. Not that I got a bottle. I said zero for four. I'm on a very, very fun losing streak, maybe next year. Um, but I very much appreciate your time. As always, uh, you've given us a fantastic insight into what it is to be a, a blender on the Redbreast team. And um, to everyone who is watching live, listening back on podcasts or on YouTube, thank you so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and I hope for those who were lucky enough to get one of those bottles uh, that they're enjoying uh, the fantastic and, and quintessential Irish whiskies that, that come from Irish distillers and uh, the old middle or the new Middleton distillery and and Redbreast as well. So Dave, and to everyone watching, thank you so much for your time. Absolute pleasure, Matt. As always. <laughs>